chemical reactions occur all the time. And there are a lot of different ways you can tell whether a chemical reaction has happened or not. Typical ways you can visually see if a chemical reaction has happened are things such as color change, the formation of precipitates or solids within a solution, or the formation of a gas. However, it's these reactions looking at the formation and the dissolving of a solid that we're going to focus on in this experiment. Solids can either be formed in a reaction or they can dissolve in a reaction. And this experiment focuses on the ability of solutions to form solids, form precipitates, and the solubility of the solid itself. This experiment focuses on the periodicity of the periodic table, which is inferring different trends within the periodic table itself based on its shape. Are things smaller or larger as you move from left to right? Are they more reactive or less reactive as you move from top to bottom? The periodic table and the shape of that table uh, is in such a way that these, there are these trends throughout it. Specifically, we'll be looking at the solubility trend uh, within the periodic table for different metal ions. This experiment is one of the first ones where you're seeing a lot of different chemical reactions. Um, the last experiment, you did have the flame test and you saw those and the different colors, but this is uh, an experiment where you're probably thinking or seeing traditional chemical reactions, where you're mixing two chemicals together and something happens. So you, you see a lot of chemical reactions all the time, whether it's burning anything, combustion reactions uh, in an engine or at a, in a fire pit. Almost everything you do when you're cooking something involves chemical reactions, all of them involved in the body in different cells, as well as photosynthesis in plants and really many, many aspects of uh, making uh, any sort of material. So a number of things can be inferred from chemical reactions. There are visual cues that you can see to, uh, to determine if a chemical reaction has taken place. So some of these things are a change in color. In this example, it's going from yellow to orange. Uh, the formation of a solid. So you mix two liquids together and you get a solid, a precipitate. Or the dissolving of a solid. You have a solid and you add a little bit of some type of liquid and the solid completely goes away. There's the formation of gas. So you'll see bubbles in a reaction, like if you mix baking soda and vinegar, things that not, aren't necessarily seen with your eyes, but do indicate a chemical reaction is the change in temperature. Uh, you can feel it getting warmer or colder and the change in pH or the, the acid level within uh, a solution. So these are different things that you, can t uh, that you can measure or see to tell a chemical reaction has taken place. And in this experiment, we're focusing more on this one, the formation of a solid. <clears throat> so every uh, compound or most all compounds have a solubility. This is the amount of that solid that can dissolve in water. If you take some table salt, table salt itself is a solid but you can take that and dissolve it in water where it's no longer a solid, 
and it's no longer pure water. It is a solution of salt water. So different compounds have different amounts that they're able to, uh, that are able to be dissolved in water. So at a concentration of 0.1 molar, silver nitrate is completely soluble. It's fully dissolved in water. Silver chloride, however, at a concentration of 0.1 does not exist. A lot of the silver chloride will precipitate and form a solid in the solution at the bottom and the liquid on top is saturated. There is an amount of silver chloride dissolved in that liquid on top that's incredibly small, but it is still there. Silver nitrate can dissolve more than silver chloride. It has a higher solubility. So, as I said, all of these different compounds can dissolve in water to some extent, but it does vary. And this can vary uh, oh, with temperature. Usually increasing the temperature will increase the solubility. And over the years, there have been a lot of these actual numerical values that have been measured, and these are found in solubility tables. And a very extensive one is found on the Wikipedia page for a solubility table. This has a lot of different compounds in it, and while not the best source to use as a specific reference for a peer-reviewed journal or report, it is a very good starting point to get a quick reference of what the numerical solubility for a compound would be. So when you're using a solubility table, like the one on Wikipedia, it will look something like this one. So there will be a list of the different compounds. It may or may not have the chemical formulas listed. And then it is a table of numbers. And as I had mentioned, the solubility of a compound is dependent on temperature. So there may have, uh, a solubility table may have a couple of different values for the same compound uh, because these are the solubility values at different uh, temperatures. The units on a solubility table is how much material is able to be dissolved in water. And most of the time, it should be listed on the table that this is the amount of solid that is able to be dissolved in 100 milliliters of water. So the overall unit for the solubility of copper sulfate at 20 degrees Celsius would be 36.1 grams per 100 milliliters. But having that uh, value, you can also see how much is able to be dissolved in one milliliter. So you can convert that from grams per 100 milliliters to grams per milliliter. And in this case, the solubility with 0.361 uh, grams. It can also be converted to the uh, chemistry concentration unit of molarity, which is discussed a little later on uh, in the semester. Now you'll notice not in a solubility table, not every box is filled. This does not mean that a value does not exist. It just means that this table just didn't include it. It might not ever have been measured specifically at that temperature, but it would exist in some form. Uh, there are a lot of numbers, so think about every single compound in existence ever at every single temperature. There is no way a, a table could contain all of those numbers. So many times, uh, especially in older tables, uh, not every compound is included and not every temperature. Uh, some Solubility tables may also just list things as soluble or insoluble. This is a quick reference to see just if something 
can be dissolved, but without any uh, actual values. Pretty much everything though does have a value associated with it. So even in this case of silver chloride, it is a very small value, only 0 0.0001923 grams are able to be dissolved in 100 milliliters of water. So that is a minuscule amount, but it still does exist. Even in the case of something like lead sulfide, which is incredibly insoluble, there is a number that exists, it has been measured, um, and so water is able to dissolve a minuscule amount of that, but really barely anything. Solubility and the solubility value relates to how much of a solid can dissolve in water. In the reaction of lead nitrate with sodium chloride, the solid that would be produced is lead chloride. This, however, is slightly soluble in water. At low concentrations, the precipitate forms and then quickly dissolves as it is below the solubility limit. However, at higher concentrations, the precipitate stays for longer and eventually becomes a fully cloudy solution as the limit has been reached for lead chloride. Experimentally, you can look at how uh, soluble a compound is based on performing a number of different reactions. And that's what this experiment looks at, is performing a number of different reactions and seeing how soluble something is. So if something is very soluble, it would form a precipitate with very few things. So things like the alkali metals or all nitrate salts, these are very, very incredibly soluble things, and by reacting them with other compounds, no solid forms. They are soluble. But if something is very insoluble, such as lead or barium or carbonate compounds, if you have a solution of one of these compounds and mix them with something else, they will form a precipitate and you will see this. So in this uh, picture example right here, these two combinations are soluble and these combinations are insoluble. Uh, the compounds formed on this side have a very low solubility where the compounds involved on the other side have a very high solubility. The same are Solubility and reactivity, though, have an inverse relationship. So something that is very soluble means it dissolved. It did not form a precipitate with anything. It stayed dissolved in water, so it did not react. It was very soluble, but uh, not reactive. Likewise, if you have a compound like silver ions, Silver ions are very, very reactive and they form a precipitate and come out of solution with almost anything. Silver ions are very reactive, but very insoluble. So whatever, uh, whatever is soluble is typically non-reactive and whatever is insoluble is more reactive. This experiment is a qualitative experiment. You are just looking at overall patterns. You're not focusing on the specific values and amounts, but the overall trend and the trend within the periodic table. So how you look at this and rank the solubility and rank the reactivity is by looking at how many reactions something occurs or something uh, that occur. So in this example, in these two 
pictures right here. You have one solution. It formed a reaction and formed a precipitate with three separate things. So in this, uh, this reactant, metal ion A, caused three reactions and precipitated three times. Metal ion B, in reacting with the same solutions, uh, produced five different precipitates. It reacted five times where this compound only reacted three. That means that compound B is more reactive. There are more reactions than in compound A, but compound A, the metal ion A, is more soluble. It's able to dissolve in more environments than the second one. So one thing that's very important to know in this reaction is, or in this experiment, is the fact that you're looking at metal ions. So these metal ions are different from the metals themselves. So in the case of something like sodium chloride, you are looking at the reaction and precipitation patterns and solubility of sodium chloride the sodium ion and the chloride ion. Sodium ion is in table salt. It dissolves in water. It's very inert. It doesn't really react with anything. You eat it. Sodium metal, the pure metal from the periodic table, is an incredibly reactive metal that will explode in water. They are not the same thing. When you are recording something or when you are writing something in a report or really anywhere, you need to indicate whether it's an ion, whether it's a metal or uh, something like that because Na is completely different than Na+. In these reactions, in this experiment, you're focusing on the metal ions themselves. So when writing them out, you can either include the different charges, or if you're writing out the words, you can write out ion after it to indicate that you are working with the ion compounds and not the direct elements themselves. Overall, this experiment focuses on the trend of solubility as it relates to position on the periodic table. The periodic table is arranged in such a way where different elements with similar properties are grouped in the same column and the same row or period. As you're going through this experiment, you're looking at the number of times uh, an ion reacts, and where is it on the periodic table. You're looking to see, as you move from left to right on the periodic table, do compounds become more soluble or less soluble? As you move from top to bottom on the periodic table, do things become more reactive or less reactive? There are a lot of different trends that are associated with the position on the periodic table. And this experiment focuses on the joint trend of solubility and reactivity. This experiment looks at the trends associated with solubility and reactivity of the metal ions and you're looking at it based on the shape of the periodic table. Uh, something like vanadium, so, or the vanadium ion. Is that reactive? Is it soluble? Uh, is the cesium ion reactive? Is it soluble? Uh, lead ion, reactive, soluble? If you look at the periodic table and based on their position, you could infer kind of a general sense of is one thing more reactive than the other. 
So the periodic table is shaped and grouped in such a way that like compounds or, or elements with similar properties are in the same group. So you see the periodic table is in this sort of a shape. And again, like uh, elements with like properties are in the same group or the same columns. Um, and there are the different sections of the periodic table. So I have the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, transition metals, the rare earth metals down here, and then uh, noble gases, halogens, uh, post-transition metals, these sorts of things. And where things are on the periodic table plays an important role in inferring what types of reactions and how uh, the different properties of those elements. So there, some of the other periodic trends uh, can be seen here. So atomic radius. Uh, in the lower left has a high atomic radius and in the upper right has a small atomic radius. The overall trend goes from large to small as you move up and to the right. Electronegativity has the opposite trend. Uh, things that are in the upper right are very electronegative while things in the lower left are very not electronegative. The trend uh, moves from upper right to lower left. Ionization energy is similar. Melting point seems to have in the transition metals have the hot have a high melting point versus lower melting points towards the end. And it's these types of trends in the periodic table that this experiment is looking at but not these direct measurements, but solubility. As you move from left to right on the periodic table, do the metal ions become more soluble or less soluble? Do they become more reactive or less reactive? Also, as you're moving from top to bottom, do things become more soluble or less soluble or more reactive or less reactive. And that's what this experiment is looking at and that's what you're inferring from all of the different precipitation patterns. This experiment focuses on looking at the solubility and reactivity trends of the metal ions throughout the periodic table as well as identifying what solubility is and what the values mean using an, a solubility table. Both of these can be found on the video links here, uh, the link to the experiment video, as well as a link to the solubility table. In the experiment, you're relating how soluble something is to how reactive, reactive it is. So you will be seeing how the different metal ions react with different things. And overall, you're going to be just counting how many times one metal ion reacts versus another. The fewer reactions and fewer precipitates that are formed, uh, make it more soluble. If an ion reacts more and forms more precipitates, it is less soluble. In the report form, you're recording your observations and whether or not a reaction takes place in an array. And what that is, is setting up almost a, a large table of all the different possible combinations. So you'll be reacting all of these different metal nitrate salts. Nitrates themselves are soluble and are already in solution. And you are reacting those with different alkali metal salts. So sodium ions and one potassium ion. All of these are soluble as well. 
you'll notice the first row or the first column is sodium nitrate. This is the negative control. If something reacts with sodium nitrate and forms a precipitate, it really shouldn't because nitrates are soluble. And if a precipitate forms with uh, sodium nitrate, it's an indication that there could be some contamination and would need to be repeated. So as you go through and watch all of these different reactions, each well or each vial is a mixture of both of these, com both of these things in combination. And you're going through and recording what the observations are in each of them. And then at the end, tallying up the number of different reactions that occurred. So if aluminum nitrate reacts with three things and barium nitrate reacts with four things, that means barium ions are more reactive and aluminum ions are more soluble. That's how you would interpret the results. The very last uh, part of uh, the array is looking at the precipitation pattern of an unknown. So you're given an unknown sample and you see how it reacts with all of these different precipitating agents, all of these different uh, compounds right here, the sodium and potassium compounds. In the unknown is one of, one of these metal ions. So aluminum, barium, cadmium, calcium, lead, magnesium, mercury, potassium, silver, sodium, strontium, or zinc. It is one of those. And you're going through and comparing what is the pattern of your unknown and look to see which pattern it matches with uh, for the ones that were already known, one of these metal ion salts. You will note that the sodium ions and potassium ions have the same pattern, as well as the cadmium ions and calcium ions. They also have the same pattern. So you will have to look to make sure that those, um, that if you do have one of these patterns to I indicate that it could be either. The last part of the report uses the solubility table found on Wikipedia. So this is a very useful resource. It has a lot of different solubility values um, at various different temperatures. So you can see all of the different values that it has. Um, and again, being Wikipedia, while this would not be a uh, source for a scientific journal. It is a great starting off point to find an approximate value for what a solubility would be. So you will use this table and look up different values and interpret these numbers in order to answer the, uh, the questions at the end of the report. Some things to note about when you're using the solubility table, just to kind of keep in mind, make sure to understand what the units of the solubility table uh, are, what solubility actually means, what does this number mean, and how temperature actually affects the solubility of something. So you're looking again for a pattern associated with solubility and temperature. Overall, this experiment is looking at the solubility and reactivity of metal ions and how it relates to their position on the periodic table. Moving from left to right, as well as from top to bottom on the periodic table can show different trends from electronegativity, ionic size, atomic size, density. There are a lot of different things that can be inferred based solely on where an element is on the periodic table. And this experiment focuses on solubility and reactivity.